Good morning to our attendees in the Western Hemisphere and good afternoon and good evening to our attendees uh, in other parts of the world in the Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, my name is Jason Close uh, and I'm the Vice President of Product and Platform here at CMG and I'd like to welcome you today to CMG's webinar on de-risking carbon storage investment with simulation. Just a few housekeeping uh, items before we go and get started. Uh, you'll be able to see that there is a comment section uh, likely on the right hand side of your screen uh, and from that section you'll be able to ask questions during the presentation uh, and we'll do our best to get to some of those at the end of the presentation uh, and if we don't we'll do our best to reach out to you following the presentation uh, to answer your questions or clarify those that we've tried to answer. Uh, just as a warm up to, to get us started this morning or this afternoon this evening. Uh, I'd like us to go in and answer a quick question here. Uh, you should see uh, a Slido question uh, that's appeared or uh, on, your, on your chat screen, uh, but you should also see uh, on the screen the opportunity to, to join at slido.com uh, and you can enter in uh, the 8804536. Uh, and the question that we're asking this morning is, what is the perceived risk of carbon storage projects today? And right now we, we have a few answers, some, some high risk uh, and some, some low risk, uh, not very many people with, with medium risk. Uh, so that's, that's quite interesting. Um, what, I, what I'd like to, to present or what I hope we can present today is that, is that there is some risk and, and there are ways that through simulation and through the, the use of technology uh, that we do have the ability uh, to actually uh, understand that risk and, and mitigate some of that risk. Oh, now we're starting to see some changes here. So we see high risk, okay, lots of high risk. I, and I think that's how, how we've seen and what we feel from our, our contact with industry is that, is that we, we definitely deem there's, there's significant risk. Great, so what I'd like to do now uh, is introduce our presenter today. Uh, our presenter today is, is Kieran Venipali, and, and Kieran is the product manager for Unconventionals and Energy Transition Solutions at CMG. Uh, Kieran's been with CMG uh, for over a decade. Prior to joining CMG, he, has, he achieved a master's degree in petroleum engineering. Uh, while at CMG, uh, he's worked as a reservoir simulation engineer as well as in the business side of the business, and, and he's worked on simulation in conventionals, unconventionals, EOR and more recently in energy transition. So, so a, a great person for us to be listening to this morning. Uh, so I hope you're excited to, to hear what, what Kieran has to say. Uh, I know I am. Uh, and at, at this point, I'll hand it over to Kieran. Thank you, Jason. Um, hope everybody can see my screen uh, right now. Um, again, once again, thank you, Jason, for your introduction. Um, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining this webinar from all over the world, I hope. Um, so today's topic is how to de-risk carbon storage investments with technology, especially with numerical simulation. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you will have a pretty good understanding of what are the risks associated with your CO2 storage projects. And I'm glad to see that there is a, there's a everybody perceives that it's a high risk uh, uh, projects here. So I want you to understand what is the risk associated with this one and how do you quantify those uncertainties so that uh, uh, you could safeguard your investments today okay all right with without a further ado let's get to the next one so everybody likes a story so let's start with a with a, with a story here in a, with, this is my story so several months ago i started uh, working with on a with a client on a co2 storage project of course and then we were having these discussions about what physics goes into it and what kind of parameters do i need to put in what is the optimum scenario what is the um, what kind of uh, sensitivity should I run so that I get the optimum injection strategy and et cetera. Trust me, these are really long, deep discussions. So later in the day, we were having lunch and then I want to ask the, the director of this uh, uh, project. And then I asked this question, I said, why is it so important for you to capture all this physics, um, all these optimization scenarios? And when we are running really hundreds and thousands of optimization scenarios. And then I asked, why is it so important? And the answer that he gave me was really surprising, at least at that time. He said, Kiran, we've been we paid already for a project in the past almost $300 million. I repeat, $300 million in civil penalties to different regulatory bodies, particularly EPA, Environmental Product, Product Agency, 
on uh, to resolve some Clean Air Act violations in this case. So he said, if this were to be modeled at the time, if the scenario was modeled at the time, we could have saved the whole investment um, uh, with the right tools and the right physics. And particularly if we would have spent some insignificant fraction of the amount of the $300 million that we have spent on the right tools, we could have avoided this whole situation. He said, going forward, particularly in the CO2 world, I want to be absolutely certain that we have the right tools, right physics, so that we could protect our investments. And that's what he said. And of course, that created a lot of curiosity in me. And then I went back and then I started researching. Are there any other companies that have been in the same situation? Sure enough, there are thousands of companies um, that have been in the same uh, same position where paying hefty fines to the regulators. So. In fact, there is a tracker where you could see it in the um, in the bottom right here. You could track this. Just in U.S., the oil and gas industry, our industry, has paid $53 billion, $53 billion to different regulatory bodies all across the globe, sorry, uh, in America, um, in the last 20 to 22 years. I mean, just imagine this. So this is the past in 2000, if, since 2000, that means in 22 years, if we paid these fines, but now all of us are collectively moving into, into this new era, new energy era, where we are trying to find these game changing solutions, particularly to reduce the emissions through carbon store, capture and storage, right? So again, we are going into future with the CO2 and just imagine if there was a CO2 leakage uh, from the storage side all the way to the surface, trust me, we'll end up paying another $53 billion, but this time it may not take 20 years. It might take just two to three years to do uh, to happen. That's exactly what we wanted to avoid. That's exactly what I want to talk to you today. How do you de-risk your entire project? How do you carefully plan, design, and execute your project so that all of us, we get it right, but not only get it right, but we also make it safer. So. I want you to remember this story, and that's going to be theme of our entire presentation today. I want you to keep this in mind, and then I'll, I'll, when I'm presenting, I'll go back to this story so that we know what exactly we are doing. Again, the theme: how do we de-risk uh, this project so that we don't pay these fines? We'll make it safer. There is no CO2 leakage into the surface, and etc. Okay. So before going into the meat of the uh, presentation, I want to give you a, a quick agenda, what we are going to discuss today. First of all, who we are. Trust me, I'm not giving a sales pitch here. I'm just going to talk about why you should listen to us, why you should even consider listening to us, what is CMG's credibility in this arena. So I'll give you a very quick update on that one. And then why does CCS matters? Why so much buzz about this CCS, uh, particularly in the last few years? And then I want to give a risk assessment, the very high level risk assessment that are associated with this CO2 storage projects. And then we'll talk about what are the physics. And trust me, I'm not going to bore you, bore you with a bunch of theory. I actually wanted to give you a real field offshore Gulf of Mexico CO2 storage example. This is a real field example that we are working with client. Um, client was kind enough to um, give us permission to show this. So I wanted to have this real field example and the physics associated with it and what are the risks associated with it and how we are helping this client to de-risk all these problems. Okay. And finally, we'll conclude the presentation uh, with, with, with the nice thoughts. So that's the quick agenda that's going to talk in the roughly in the next 30, 35 minutes. Hopefully we're all on the same page at this point and then uh, let's go forward. Okay. It's a really nice feel-good story for CMG. CMG actually started in a small room at the back of a library at University of Calgary. After 44 years, it actually started in 1978. So after 44 years of the pure innovation, the continued innovation, today we are in 75 countries serving more than 600 customers. And then I'm proud to say this, that 50% of CMG workforce is focused on still innovation, research, and development so that we find these new challenges associated with these new technologies and we, we give you the right physics and the right tools and then make the entire process, again, um, easier for you. So if I had to put it in one sentence, CMG is a global simulation technology company 
with the sole focus and aim to solve complex energy challenges. That's what we are. So let's switch gears and then let's talk about CCS. Why does CCS matter? Let's get one thing straight. The demand for the resources is not going to go down, particularly in the next 30 to 40 years. Of course, we'll have wind, solar, nuclear. All these things are going to remain the alternate to global energy supplies, and we need that for sure going forward. However, the demand for the heavy emitters right now, the power, the utilities, the agriculture, or oil and gas, the demand for these is going to stay even further, even longer than we anticipated. In fact, interestingly, I was attending a conference a few weeks ago, and the keynote luncheon speaker was the vice president at Chevron. And then he was presenting these uh, beautiful statistics from IEA, um, International Energy Agency. And he mentioned that today, we are burning more wood chips today than we did 100 years ago. We are burning more coal today than we did 100 years ago. We are going to use more oil and gas today than we did several decades ago. And this is going to go up in the next 30 years, particularly by 2050, because we are going to add at least another 2 billion population to this planet Earth. So the demand is going to go up. That means the emissions are going to go up at least until we hit that net zero goal. So how do you balance that? Actually, it is perceived that the best cost effective way is carbon capture, capture that CO2, and then put it back into the ground. That is CCS, carbon capture and sequestration. In fact, today, we are sequestering almost 40 million tons of CO2 per year. And then going into 2050, where our net zero goals are, um, it's going to go up to 7,600 million tons of CO2 per year. So what does that mean? As the demand goes up, we need to sequester more, right? But what do you need to in order to achieve, reach that net zero goals? the more CCS plants, right? Today, we have about 44 commercial projects all across the globe. And in fact, CMG is the technology provider for more than 90% of those projects today. Going into 2030, there are at least 300 other projects planned at the various stages of development. And despite having these many projects planned already, we are still short of at least 1,300 million tons of year uh, of CO2 that needs to be sequestered uh, according to REACH or net zero targets, which is equivalent to almost 300 million cars per year taken out from the road. Why I'm mentioning this is as you have the number of projects growing, we want to make sure that we de-risk the any, any issues that, that are related with these projects so that we can build more than 300 projects, at least we can plan more than these projects and how the technology can help you with that so that again, going back to that, right? So you could have a more secure um, uh, projects that are going forward, right? So first of all, what are those risks? I mean, I'm saying that there could be more risk associated with it. So I wanted to give you a very high level. What are those risks? Of course, the first one that every, everything comes to your mind is political risk. I agree, it's not in our hands to control this one because unstable political environment or change in the energy policies priorities could derail your project, the entire project overnight. Again, that's not in our hands. So let's keep political risk aside for a second. Let's talk about something that we could have some sort of a control, the regulatory risk. Um, you can have contradictions in the policies or a weak legal framework can create a lot of uncertainty in regulatory risk. And the other hand of the regulatory risk is the time it takes for you to, from planning phase to uh, designing phase, all the way to the execution. How do you bridge that gap? Because if the pl from planning to execution takes really long time, you're putting your project at a financial risk, right? Which is highly capital intensive and it's lengthy. So these two risks, how do you mitigate those? And there comes the technology. I think, in my opinion, the technology can actually um, de-risk both regulatory and financial to a certain extent. Um, trust me, technology plays a really pivotal role, whether it's from site selection all the way to your uh, capture of CO2, uh, taking the CO2, transporting the CO2 to the storage site or storing the CO2 itself. All these segments, it's very technologically driven and then you need the right tools, right physics, right? In fact, I want you to look at this uh, report that's been generated by Department of Energy and Environmental Production Agency, 
and the report is called Rules and Tools Crosswalk. Um, just Google it. I'm sure you will find it. That's the first thing that you would get it. But all that this, this particular report talks about is uh, all the computational tools that you would require in a 13 different segments, one, three, 13 different segments throughout the life cycle of a CO2 storage project. Again, from site selection all the way to the storage. And of course, reservoir simulation is one of that categories and CMG is mentioned as one of the recommended simulator in this report. The reason why I mentioned this one is, again, go back to the story that I'm talking about, right? The story you remember, um, if you have the right tools and the right technology, you could optimize your injection strategy um, so that you know what is the injectivity issues and then you can, you can plan accordingly. You could uh, de-risk the leakage of CO2 into the environment. Um, where does the leakage happen? When does it happen? Where does the plume move? And you could do a rigorous economic analysis and then you can comply with the regulations, uh, not only comply with the regulations, but again, the planning to the um, all the all the way execution, the time it takes could be lowered and reduced by a, a significant factor if you have the right tools and the right technology. Right. So that, that's the technology that plays a pivotal role in order to de-risk your entire project. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. OK. All right. So I said uh, the technology technology plays a really big role. Um, so, but what kind of question should technology answer? What should CMG answer for you that you could you could plan your project in a certain way that you are safeguarding your investment? And there are these five big elements that technology should be answering for you. Number one, capacity. How much quantity of CO2 can be stored in, in my area of interest? Number two, injectivity. How fast can I inject? How much of CO2 can be injected safely so that again, I'm de-risking my, my project. I'm de-risking my financial um, risk as, uh, associated with the project. Containment, 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 the most important part of these five elements. What happens to the injected CO2? Is it staying in the ground? How do I de-risk the leakage if there is ever going to be? If you don't plan this in advance, you won't anticipate again, you're gonna pay these hefty fines. Containment, monitoring. Once you inject and then you shut in the well, the, the job is not done. Now you need to measure, monitor, validate the MMV plants and technology should help you with that. Finally, regulations. What are the regulatory uh, requirements? How do I comply with these regulatory requirements? How, do I, how does the technology output help me? Um, as you already know, the class six permits take a uh, year to two years and there are 1600 pages to fill. So how does technology help me to reduce this significantly so that I get the faster uh, uh, permits, right? So all these five elements are very important. And again, I want you to remember these five elements because when I show you the real field example, I'm gonna talk about these items and I'm gonna mention these items uh, where exactly we are solving injectivity issues, containment issues, and et cetera, okay? So hopefully you, you, you are with me so far and then it's gonna be very exciting going forward with the, with the real one. So I want you to quickly take this poll question um, I think my uh, our VP Jason is going to uh, do this poll at this point. Thanks, Karen. So what we're going to be doing is popping up another poll here on on Slido. So if you if you look in the the chat, you'll be able to see a link. Uh, otherwise, if you prefer the QR code, you can you can enter it here. Um, would love to know what you think about uh, the risk uh, that you see in in um, carbon storage. Uh, I think that due to the, the delay, we might see these come in a little bit slower, uh, but really interested in what people think uh, as the risk. So we're starting to see some come in now. So an, an equal spread right now between political, regulatory, and technical risk. Uh, we'll give it a few more seconds to, to come in. Um, just while we're waiting, uh, what I thought I'd just mention is, is if you do have questions or they come up during the, while Kieran's talking, go ahead and put those in the chat and, and we'll collect those uh, to ask later. So what we're seeing right now is is a good mix between technical and regulatory risk. Um, oh, political risk coming up there too. I know we don't we don't have a crystal ball, so we can't necessarily control political risk. Um, but but excited to see that a lot of people think that technical risk is quite high, and and I'm I'm glad to, that we'll be able to talk a lot about that now um, as I hand it back to Kieran as as he starts to walk us through some of those technical risks. Thanks for everyone's participation. 
Thank you, everybody. I, I think that's a, a nice, fun exercise, and I, we wanted to validate whether we are saying sense or not. And I'm glad to see that you also perceive technical risk as one of the main challenges when it comes to CO2 storage. And hopefully, in the next 15, 20 minutes, I'll be able to answer some of your concerns, address some of your concerns uh, with this example. Okay. All right. Let me set the stage here with the problem. Right. So just look at this uh, particular one. I'm injecting at a couple of locations. And I thought I would stay particularly in the lower parts of the ground here, but boom, what happens? The CO2 plume is migrating to a place where I really don't want it to be. Why is it happening? What, what are the physics that's lacking in this particular one so that I could assess this in advance and comply with that, or at least make my um, project plan or the project strategy in such a way that I would anticipate such risk and then maybe talk to the landowners or the, address the regulatory com uh, compliance and etc so that's exactly what i want to talk today how do you assess this problem how do you de-risk this in fact are you missing some physics maybe that's not the case that's happening in the real ground right so that's the problem we'll talk about before we go into the again the, the physics of it let's talk about the geological storage sites itself today starting from saline formations which is very prominent in north america region um, where you store the co2 in a saline formation what is the risk associated with saline formations? Well, it definitely has high capacity, higher capacity, relatively speaking, but we don't have the data, right? It's not like a, um, a place where you already drill several wells and you have a really rich data. We don't have the data. So you probably have to drill more wells in order to get the data before you go into the uh, designing and planning phase. Next one, um, enhanced coal bed methane. Uh, we have been doing this already, uh, particularly at certain parts of the world. Um, and the next one is CO2 EOR, enhanced oil recovery, my favorite. Uh, not only you can sequester CO2, but you could also enhance your oil and gas recovery. And finally, depleted hydrocarbon reservoirs. Again, more prominent in the European region and et cetera and elsewhere. Um, the, the problem with the depleted oil, uh, oil and gas reservoirs, not necessarily a problem, but relatively it has less storage capacity compared to uh, saline formations, for example but you have rich data. You, you know the seal is uh, uh, pretty intact, um, your fluid is gonna stay in the ground and you have all the locks and et cetera, right? Everything has its own pros and cons, but that's where you start first. Cell formations versus depleted hydrocarbon reservoirs. And today the offshore Gulf of Mexico example that I'm gonna show is actually from, is a cell formation where injecting, storing CO2. Okay, what is that physics? What is that act, act, accurate physics that you need to capture? You must capture so that you could de-risk your project, right? Um, let's start from trapping mechanisms, first of all. Uh, what are the trapping mechanisms? How, how does, what are the risks associated with it? And uh, how does it go forward starting from point zero, time, time zero to um, 100 years, 1000 years? First one, structural trapping. Again, the very basic one, it's a short-term uh, trapping mechanism. That means that's the first thing that you would hit when you put the CO2 under the ground. Um, let's look at the picture here on the right-hand side, um, the, uh, the one on the up, upper side. Uh, you have a nice anticline, a typical, seems like a typical oil and gas reservoir. You're putting the CO2. As you inject the CO2, let's say you haven't considered, you haven't done any analysis, but the pressure or the geomechanical stress has changed to a certain point. Now you are breaking the seal. What happens when you break the seal? The CO2 starts moving upwards and then goes into the surface. The exact scenario that you wanted to avoid, you should be able to quantify, right? Uh, take the picture on the lower side. Let's imagine this is a typical um, saline aquifer, for example. We don't know that there was a fault. Um, so if you're injecting, suddenly you change the stresses in such a way that it reached the, that threshold, your fault gets reactivated. So what happens? The CO2 moves into the fault through the fault or across the fault and then goes to the surface. Again, the scenario that you wanted to avoid, that's a structural trapping, but it has its own issues or uncertainties associated with it, right? What is the next one? The residual gas trapping. Um, this case, this is unlike the structural trapping, this is simply uh, a relatively lower risk scenario because uh, first of all, when you're injecting, you're following this drainage curve. And then once you uh, stop uh, injecting, what happens to the gas? Gas starts moving upwards. That means you're creating this void space here, which is filled by the water. Because of the density differences, the water starts to fill the space that's left um, empty. 
So that means that it's going to follow this indivision curve where you where your gas is now immobile. So you're trapping the gas in that pore space, um, which is more secure than structural trapping. But you should be able to capture that. If you don't capture it, because the COD is going to stay in the lower parts of it. So that means you probably can inject more gas. That means you can probably store more gas than you thought you could if you haven't considered this one. Right? Next one. Solubility trapping. Just like the name suggests, the solubility of CO2 in the water. Very simple concept. Now you, your CO2 is not in gaseous phase. Now it's an aqueous phase. Right? The liquid phase. So again, a little bit more secure than structural and residual. But what the problem with solubility trapping? Now it's in an aqueous phase. What happens to aqueous phase? It starts flowing, right? So if your area is, you know that your area of interest, but suddenly your water is migrating to an area uh, into a different land altogether. Now you need to talk to the landowners, comply with the regulations, etc. So again, a risk associated with it, but you should be able to quantify that in advance so you can plan accordingly. And the last one, mineral trapping. Here, if you see, now we started with the gas initially, structural and residual. We moved into the liquid phase. Now the CO2 is soluble in water. So that CO2 now creates bicarbonate, which reacts with the minerals uh, in the ground and precipitates calcite. So now it's going into the solid phase, which is more secure. It's not going to flow anywhere. It's going to move, not going to move anywhere. Uh, but, but, but the concern with the mineral trapping is it relatively takes longer time to achieve it. Right. So hopefully you're getting the point. If you're moving from structural trapping and everything is interdependent, you need to have residual gas trapping, solubility, mineral trapping. All these things will secure your project. You know how much CO2 you're being uh, putting in the ground so that you can plan your tax credit according to that. Right. So in short, if you take from left to right, the uh, storage security index increases going from structural all the way to the mineral trapping. And I want to talk about each and every trapping with an example. Like I said, I'm not going to bore you with the theory more. I'll show you a real field example going forward. So I'm going to move from uh, my presentation into uh, our software here, which is a result software. You're looking at uh, results here. Um, so let's talk about the model for a second. Uh, let me introduce you to the model so that we are all on the same page going forward. OK, hopefully all of you are with me so far. So here, this is a offshore Gulf of Mexico model, uh, block number ST54. You're looking at the porosity map here. So if I zoom in, you could see these uh, heterogeneous regions. That is the actual reservoir. So the region is just this one. We extended this all the way to the surface in order to do rigorous analysis, like what happens if I hit a fault? And then uh, is, the, is the CO2 goes all the way to the surface or not? Uh, speaking of faults, this one has seven faults. As you can see, the one in the pink color, those are the faults. The CO2 injector is placed uh, somewhere in the center of the reservoir. Um, very strategic placement. Uh, I'll talk about it again. So uh, hopefully you get a pretty good idea. And I'll also take you to the a, a cross section here so that uh, you could see where exactly our well is. So here is the well. You see the we are injecting into the lower parts of the reservoir. And then this is the area of interest right now. You have a fault here close to the well as well. OK, so this injection happens for almost uh, 30 years and the shut in period is about 1400 years. So we are we are actually modeling this for about 1450 years. Uh, it's an isothermal model. We are going to model both geomechanics and geochemistry. Again, very important. In fact, if you go to the permit applications, they'll talk about uh, geomechanics and geochemistry, how it's important. And you need to model these uh, according to the regulations, actually. And uh, a lot of people ask me this question, so I thought I'll just put it up front. It took roughly less than five hours for me um, to run this 1.2 million cells model, including geomechanics and geochemistry on 16 cores. I thought I'll just mention that one. Um, I'm not going to talk about the setup of the model, setup of the problem because of the time constraints. Uh, but hopefully, you can go to this particular uh, YouTube video uh, later, or you could go to YouTube and look for Computer Modeling Group, and there is a bunch of videos you could watch. Um, it will talk about 17-minute video. All that it talks about how do you set up CO2 sequestration project. And trust me, that's all it took me, about 20 minutes to set up this uh, CO2 sequestration model. Okay, so. 
hopefully you would check that out but uh, you get a pretty good idea of what the model is what we are looking for uh, and etc okay let's look at the first option which is our structural trapping like i said you have an anticline here in fact our reservoir looks more like this because you have a fault going um, and then we are injecting into the reservoir and then let's see what happens when we inject this um, into the reservoir so now you're looking at the gas saturation. As you can see, the gas is moving upwards. You see there are more and more grid blocks that are being added here uh, as you see the CO2 starts injecting into it, right? So what's happening to CO2 right now? Simple, because of the density difference, the CO2 starts moving upwards, right? That's the structural trapping. Simple phenomena, right? Density difference, CO2 is moving upwards. Then you can ask me, what's the problem here, Kiran? Again. What happens if I hit a fault? Now I reactivated the fault. Suddenly that entire CO2, because lighter in density starts moving upwards, goes all the way to the surface. Exact scenario that I don't want to have in my model or in my design phase or in my planning phase. So how do you model that? How do you, how can you um, de-risk that particular option, right? First of all, you should be able to understand what the problem is. Um, before going into that, sorry. So let's understand what this fault reactivation is. I kept saying this, but um, let me give you a, a quick synopsis of what that is. Firstly, you have two blocks here, point A and point B or point one, point two. Imagine there is a fault in between. Just imagine. Initially, it's a ceiling fault. That means there is no flow happening between one and two. Absolutely no flow. You're started injecting and the pressure is increasing. So now you're more circle starts moving into the failure envelope. Again, we are moving into this geomechanics uh, uh, studies, right? So because of that stress changes, you are now close to the failure envelope, causing the slip to happen on the fault. So the faults get reactivated. What happens when fault reactivates? The fluid starts moving from one to two, across the fault, through the fault, all the way to the surface, right? So um, can you model this? I mean, what happens when, you, when, you, when it hits the fault, when it gets reactivated? In this particular scenario, at what injection pressure and what injection um, quantity do I see my CO2 going up? Let's look at it. So now you're looking at the mole fraction of the CO2. For example, um, I'm injecting my CO2 right here. You see the faults here. The CO2 is moving towards the fault here. And initially, like I said, this fault is sealed. So there is no flow happening across the fault, right? There's no flow, absolutely. That's a secure scenario. But look here. Now, suddenly, there is a slip happened on the fault. So the CO2 starts moving across the fault. Again, right here, the CO2 starts happening across the fault. At some point, it could move through the fault as well. Does that happen in this model? You're looking at the 3D. Oh, see, the CO2 starts moving into the upper layers, upper layers, all the way to the surface. Again, the exact scenario we want to avoid. I want to show you this scenario because at this injection rate, whether I think it's about 3 million meter cube per day, at certain point, your CO2 starts moving all the way to the surface because the geomechanic stress has changed on the faults. Um, there is a reactivation happened. The CO2 started moving through it and all the way to the... We don't want this scenario. You have to be able to assess this and then plan accordingly. Then only you know that you're de-risking your project, right? That's the structural trapping that you just saw along with the geomechanics of the fault reactivation. Now, let's look at the inventory plot. Um, I'm showing the same model on a side view here, so which is a 2D view. Um, let's see when I'm injecting here where the CO2 is moving. On the right-hand side, you could see that small, thin red line on the time scale where you are. So you're looking at the supercritical CO2 in this case. Um, everything that we injected is still in the free space. So as you can see, see, the CO2 starts moving on to the upper layers. Again, because of the um, density of the CO2, it's moving into the upper layers. At some point, if the enough pressure reaches, uh, it could break the seal and then move into the surface. Again, how do you deal with that? Now let's look at uh, the next phase, which is the residual gas trapping. Can we bring the CO2 all the way to the lower parts of the uh, reservoir? Does that even happen? Yes, it does when you enable this trapping mechanisms. So again, very simple concept, the trapping, hopefully I'll, I'll explain this one more time. You have this red area, which is usually gas. So you started injecting, the entire area is filled with red initially, that means gas. 
you stop the injection now the water molecule starts come down and then imbibe into this place which is following a different curve so you could see the blue area which is water now starts to uh, take the spaces the empty spaces look at these pockets of gas which is trapped gas that's exactly what it is now the co2 can't escape it's in a trapped space uh, it is different than what the initial gas saturation is it's a trapped gas saturation and that's exactly what i want to see you in this case so let's inject you initially hopefully you could read this the dynamic trapped gas saturation is zero because you're still in on this curve you're injecting and suddenly you see a change in the uh, color that means you have more trapped gas now at the bottom of the layers on the upper side you still have the zero gas oh, sorry um, the free gas the structurally trapped gas but on the lower parts of the reservoir you have uh, trapped gas saturation so your entire gas is not in the in, near the seal most of it or some of it at least in the in the lower sections of the reservoir right if you haven't planned that one you would think you have lesser capacity for your reservoir um, than it is actually is worth so i'm showing the same thing in this case um, but actually on the on the side view right so let's go to the inventory plot again the inventory plot that i just showed you before um, in this case i'm going to show what uh, the same thing the 2d plot which you saw before i'm just comparing um, on the right hand side initially everything is structurally trapped so your gas is still go moving upwards but as the time goes on once the trapped gas saturation kicks in or the trapping uh, residual trapping kicks in most of the co2 is still in the lower layers if you remember the first one this entire co2 is not there everything is on the upper level now you have co2 on the lower level and here Again, you're not creating such enough pressure or enough changes to the stresses where your seal doesn't break yet, right? You don't have that uh, problem of leakage yet. So now you saw structural trapping, we saw residual gas trapping. Let's look at the solubility trapping and does that have any effect on the other two and how does that work? So solubility trapping, like the name says again, it's simply the CO2 getting miscible in the water or dissolving into the water right so let me just run you're looking at the water mole fraction here because aqueous phase and then let's see how that changes as you're injecting you see most of it is going aerially if you observe in the first two cases the co2 is moving upwards but in excuse me in this case the co2 is moving on the sides into the horizontal direction because again it could move upwards too if it's a density difference of the gas but here it's co2 uh, in the aqueous phase and what's the problem associated with it? Now, wherever the water migrates, your CO2 is migrating. Is it going into a different land uh, port space? Uh, do we need to talk to those landowners? Um, but the best part is the CO2 is still coming down. In fact, it's going into the underburden region here, not into the overburden region, right? Um, so that's, and also, as you have more water coming in, trickling down because of the convection effects, you will have more trapped gas saturation as well. Something to remember everything is uh, interdependent here so let me show you the same thing on a horizontal scale again you're looking at the um, on the right hand side you're looking at the uh, sorry the uh, structural trapping and also gas trapping and also dissolved gas right so as the time goes on which one kicks in if you see the structural trapping is coming down and the dissolved gas is going up and also the sorry the gas trapped gas is going up dissolved gas is going up at some point, if you run for further years, maybe they'll cross. That's the most secure form of uh, keeping the CO2 under the ground, right? So we looked at uh, structural, we looked at the gas trap, we looked at the solubility, and now comes the most secure form, which is uh, mineralization, right? The mineral trapping in this case. Um, very quickly, simple. You have now aqueous rich CO2 um, in the aqueous phase that creating bicarbonates, and this bicarbonates, if you have a calcium ions present in the model, particularly calcium ions coming from an orthite dissolution, reacts with it, and then that forms calcite. So the CO2 is transformed into a calcite mineral here, right? So we should be able to model this because this is the most secure form of it. And in some of the regulations, it actually needs it to do, right? So I usually get asked this question, hey, I don't have this data, or I don't know anything about these reactions and et cetera. So that's why we created this database where you have about three databases and hundreds of reactions. All that you need to do is just type in calcite, 
you get the equation, certain equation, and then you just add that equation in this case. Um, you add the reaction kinetics. If you have data, it's great. But if you don't have data, it's more reason for you to use the technology, use the right tools to quantify that uncertainty because you don't know that quantity, um, uh, that particular uh, data. So you should be able to run sensitivities. So you have the best case scenario, worst case scenario. Again, probabilistic uh, forecasting, right? P10, P50, P90. What is my best versus worst? So we should be able to do that uh, if you have the, again, right tools, right technology, and the data that you have with it. So the next one that I'm going to show you is how does this calcite uh, precipitate in this particular model? Um, and also, hopefully, you will be able to see how does that change the porosity? Because it's a calcite mineral. It's blocking the pores. So your CO2 um, is... Uh, Sorry, it's blocking the port, so your porosity is changing, right? Now you have a lesser porosity than you, you, you would started at the first place. Initially, it's a negative. That means the uh, calcite is dissolving, not necessarily precipitating. But as you go to the end of the um, model, you could see most of the CO2 has been precipitated. Sorry, calcite uh, has been precipitated. And uh, on the right-hand side, you're looking at the delta porosity. So all these blocks have a lesser porosity now because of that uh, calcification happening in this one, right? Sorry, the calcite, yeah, the uh, precipitation. So let's look at the inventory plot, the ultimate plot, having all the physics, having a peace of mind here that I de-risk my project. Um, everybody wants to, of course, look at this one. So let's look at this particular uh, inventory plot. Um, you're looking on the right-hand side, how the mineral is, uh, um, the calcite is forming. And on the left-hand side, you're seeing, again, that red thin line, on your time scale, at any point of time, what is my dominant trapping mechanism? Initially, of course, it's structural, but as the time goes on, you have dissolved, even mineral is coming up. Of course, it takes time, but it's coming up. All those trapping mechanisms are happening in the reservoir, right? So hopefully you got a pretty good idea. I'm able to show you that one. So let me get back to our uh, uh, presentation. Uh, we are nearing the end of these slides now. Um, I want to show you the final optimization scenario. I, I think this is my, again, my favorite slide. Uh, we have done hundreds of optimization scenarios just to look at, again, that worst case scenario to best case. I'm just presenting three of those. Um, how does the low injection versus medium to high injection rates affect your reservoir or leakage, right? On the lower side, that's the most safest one for sure. If I go to a little bit of medium injection rate, it started moving into the overburden region. That means there is a break in the seal or a fault got reactivated. But at the higher injection rate, that's the worst case scenario, which I'm already planning towards, right? So I shouldn't be injecting at this rate or I need to change my injection strategy, location, and et cetera, right? So this is a optimization scenario. And that's exactly what I'm saying. The tools should be able to help you to come up with these kind of analysis, uh, an educated guess, right? An educated so that you do smart investments, smart decisions. So far, what I discussed was uh, geological uncertainty, I would say, because um, the solubility depends on salinity, right? Uh, something I cannot control, but I could plan accordingly. Um, the residual gas trapping, I cannot control, but I can plan accordingly. Structural trapping, what kind of seal do I have? All those are geological uncertainties. As we are spending more time on these projects, remember I said almost 90% of the project we, we've been working on, as we spend more time, we are finding these new challenges or new risks and the list keeps going on going on adding up and now i'm talking about operational risk um for example take water vaporization what happens when you have a lot of salinity in the reservoir um, because of the injection pressure near the well bore your water gets evaporated um, causing salt precipitation it causes injectivity issues remember the five elements um, well bore dynamics uh, how does the phase change work in the well bore itself CO2 moves from gaseous to or supercritical state, what state it is it in? And how does that affect my injection uh, pressure? Or how does it affect my containment of the uh, CO2 in the reservoir? Again, some, some of the wellbore um, dynamics risks, um, that comes down to surface facility consideration. If I'm injecting X quantity, what kind of compressor do I need? What kind of pipelines do I need to build? Uh, what should be the diameter? What should be the design of it? All that is a risk, and then we should be able to model that. Finally, the hydrate formation, um, does that affect my injection again in the reservoir or in the pipelines and et cetera? So 
for this particular model we are moving into the phase two and we are doing all this analysis hopefully we'll have another webinar to talk about purely operational risk associated with it but i just want to give you an idea what those risks are today and uh, we should be able to model this we should be considering this so that again going back to that initial um, story we de-risk our model we don't pay hefty fines we create a safer environment um, going into the future so you know to conclude this entire talk um, technology can mitigate regulatory and financial risk it plays a really pivotal role again early time risk is dominated by structural trapping but you have other trapping mechanisms that could probably lower risk a little bit but we should be able to assess that and model it right and finally I want to leave you with this one. Um, CMG simulation technology or modern workflows help you to quantify and reduce the risk. And I want you to, I want you to consider um, de-risking your projects. Uh, how does the technology help use the right tools, right technology, so that we are not only, again, going back to my first statement, we are not only doing it right, but we are also doing it safer uh, for the future generations. On that note, I would like to thank everybody that joined this uh, webinar today and uh, I'll take any questions you may have. Thanks, Kieran. Um, there's there's quite a few questions here in the in the chat. Um, I know that that someone did ask about the the YouTube uh, video uh, that you quoted in your in your slide and and we'll we'll send that that out yep. to um, to I think it's Adi because um, it, it looks like he he had a truck he tried to look for it and couldn't find it. so so I'll make sure that we get that awesome. to you. Um, we have another another question here from from David. Um, he's asking, are there any operational tricks that can help maximize hysteresis and or solubility tracking? For instance, turning on or off injection periodically um, or even WAG. Great question. Actually, um, because of time concerned, I didn't mention this one. But uh, yes, if you inject, uh, for example, water, we could do um, kind of a WAG injection like you mentioned. Um, when you inject water into the upper layers, now that starts moving into the downwards. So that creates more trapping mechanism, right? So that traps more gas. Um, in fact, uh, having an infinite acting aquifer, for example, if you want to model that, um, that would affect uh, that would also um, affect your uh, structural trapping as well in this case, because now you can inject more CO2. You have a lot of pressure um, on the site. So yes, th those are also... Uh, something that you can consider a VAG or injecting CO2 um, along with water on the upper layers, uh, those all affect your uh, um, answers. Yes. Great. Thanks, Kieran. We have a question from Alexander. Do you have a resource you can share to determine the rock types where expected mineralization is negligible, minor or major? Maybe just comment a little bit on, on where that's possible and, and maybe we can send something to Alexander after the fact. Could, could you repeat the question? I missed the first part of the question. Sorry. Do you have a, a resource you can share for determining the rock types where expected mineralization is either negligible, minor, or yep. major? Um, maybe you could just give some insight on, on where we might be most considered where we would be most can, concerned about mineralization. Yeah, sure. Um, so it all depends on the mineralogy as well. First of all, whether you have what type of minerals do you have? Um, to start with, for example, you have a lot of uh, anorthite. It dissolves into calcium ions, which actually helps you mineralize more. Um, so uh, again, if you wanted some data on the on the mineralization or the mineral trapping, we have these databases that could help you with that. Uh, in some cases, if you don't have data, you would start with some kind of sensitivities um, so that you can kind of understand uh, whether it even help helping me or not, or whether it's even important in this in this particular scenario or not. Hopefully, I was able to answer that one, um, but yeah. Awesome, thanks. Um, we have a question from Diego, um, and I don't I don't know the answer to this question, Kieran. So so I hope I hope you <laughs> okay. do. Um, are there any special controls implemented to deal with CO two massive volume change uh, when the injected fluid changes from supercritical to gas inside the reservoir? Wow, that's a good question. Um, we can model, in this particular case, uh, we haven't modeled temperature effects and all, but yes, we could model those uh, temperature effects, um, uh, particularly when, when the CO2 changes phase from supercritical to gaseous phase and et cetera. How does that affect your, uh, um, your trapping mechanisms or other thing? We can model that one, but um, I, don't have, uh, I don't have any solid answer today, but yes, we can model that if that's... 
I think Kieran, to add to that, um, we're involved in a, in a joint industry project uh, looking at uh, the phase behavior of supercritical CO2 and, and changes and specifically in the well bore. So, so one of the challenges we see, especially in depleted gas reservoirs is during injection. Yeah. Um, phase change in the well bar can change the injectivity significantly. And, and so we're involved in a joint industry project with Kongsberg Digital, as well as I believe now 12 uh, industry partners. Yep. Uh, so, so an area of high interest. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm going to ask the question here. Sorry, go uh, ahead. I was just uh, saying what you said again. Go ahead. Yeah, awesome. So, we have a question from Annabelle. It says, can you model all these physical phenomena in stars for the Joule Thompson consideration as well as geomechanics? Short answer is yes. You could use stars to model all these things. Yeah. And we, in fact, we have and we, a. And we can model sorry. You, yeah, and Joule Thompson in, in GEM. Correct. As well, yeah, right? you could also model uh, Joule Thompson in GEM as well because GEM can also do non isothermal. Um, in fact, we have actually some case study. Hopefully, we'll have a webinar on that particular operational risk or Joule Thompson modeling. Um, well, some some idea, you're giving ideas to our marketing now. That's great. Thanks. Awesome. So, so we have a question from William, uh, and it says, "How do you simulate the reactivation of the fault?" Sure. Um, uh, the reactivation of the fault happens because when it reaches some kind of a threshold slip displacement, what we call. So usually the faults are slipping because you are perturbing the pore pressure. But you have a threshold. Again, you could find this from the lab studies or maybe a literature review. Um, it reaches a threshold where the slip becomes actually heavier, where suddenly the seal kind of activated. So it's not no more sealing fault. Once you re hit that uh, threshold value, the fluid starts moving across or through the fault. Uh, so that's how you model fault reactivation. You definitely need geomechanics for that um, to correctly model that one. OK. Uh, so we have a, a question here from Irma. It says, can you tell me, did you also model the reservoir until the surface depth? And do you put the layer of underground storage for drinking water into your model? Uh, in this case, we modeled all the way to the surface, but we haven't added any aquifers in the um, in the upper or underburden, uh, sorry, overburden region. But that's a cool idea. Yes, we could add some kind of an aquifer, a um, little bit of high permeable zone, and then see if the leaked CO2 can contaminate the, <coughs> excuse me, the groundwater. Um, we haven't done in this case, but certainly can be done. Awesome. Um, so we have a, a question from Sasan that says, the porosity change during mineral precipitation did not seem significant. Um, is there a way to run extreme cases with significant porosity change? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, it goes back to the reaction kinetics. Uh, how fast your reaction is happening in this case the uh, the bicarbonate reacting with the calcium ions and then uh, how it's forming your calcite if you have more calcite forming uh, in this particular case like i said actually initially the calcite is dissolving but if you put your reaction kinetics in such a way that your calcite start precipitating from zero day zero you'll have a <coughs> huge change in the porosity and you should be able to model that and then quantify that that's a good answer, Karen. I was. I also mentioned that uh, we've we've looked at some some CO two sequestration in in the Middle East where they're looking at injecting into carbonates, yep. uh, and you want to talk about major uh, porosity changes, uh, not necessarily blockage, but but large increases in porosity. Yep. You know, when you're injecting something that turns into a carbonic acid into a, a carbonate reservoir, that that definitely can change the uh, the porosity quite a, quite significantly. Yep. So, so we do have a question of which geomechanics software deals well with CMG um, that you recommend. Uh, Kieran, I think you, you probably have a good answer for that. Um, CMG does it everything. So you could actually use CMG. Uh, in fact, uh, again, we, we, we can go into too many details and I don't want this to be a sales presentation, but um, you could use geomechanics on all our simulators. You could model this either in uh, um, isothermal or non-isothermal uh, locations and et cetera. So, um, you don't have to go out of CMG if you want to have geochemistry and geomechanics involved in your models. And so this model, Kieran, you did use full, a yes. full finite um, element geomechanics simulation from reservoir to surface. Correct. Is that Correct. right? We use the full wow. 3D uh, finite element geomechanics and also geochemistry in this models. 
Okay, and I've got, I've got a question from Diego, a clarification one of uh, which EOS have you used um, in this model? Uh, Ping Robinson. Okay, awesome. Um, I think we're almost out, out of time. Can I ask you one one question, yes. Kieran? Um, I'm going to ask you one that you're not prepared for. Uh, so you're probably gonna uh, you're gonna you're gonna hurt me afterwards. But but I know you've dealt with a lot of these reservoirs, and, and we've talked a lot about risk. Um, we've talked a bit about geomechanics today, uh, and, and really focused on saline aquifers, where where we know we have lots of storage. Yes. Space. Um, do you do you? perceive from your experience that there's more risk in saline aquifers versus depleted reservoirs or, or less risk? Um, very good question, uh, Jason. Purely in the point of data, because it's a saline aquifer, we never drilled any wells or anything. I would think saline aquifers purely because we don't have any idea of what uh, the underground structure, the seals or anything. I would say saline aquifers is a little bit more riskier in terms of CO2 storage applications than uh, depleted hydrocarbon reservoirs. Again, because we have a rich data available for depleted reservoirs because we've been exploring this for a while. Uh, on that perspective, saline aquifers uh, pose a little bit more risk than uh, other formations. Thanks, Karen. So I think at this point, we're, we're right at the, the top of the hour. I'd like to thank everyone for uh, attending today. Uh, if we didn't answer your question or you need clarity on, on that, that answer, we'll, we'll reach out to you just to make sure. Uh, if you have additional questions, feel free to reach out to Kieran and I directly. Uh, if you know our emails, that's great. If not, you can link out, le reach out to us directly on LinkedIn or to your, your specific CMG contact, and, and we'd be happy to answer more questions or have more discussions. Um, and just stay tuned uh, to CMG to, to hear about more webinars specifically about sequestration coming up in, in our series uh, in the next few months. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Kieran, for all the insight thanks, as well. Thanks a lot.